This video talks about restrictive cardiomyopathy that is due to diastolic dysfunction and kind of explain what is happening. Now when it comes to board, board can be very very wordy. If you don't understand a certain word or what it really means physiologically or pathophysiologically, then you might be in trouble. You might be in trouble. So in this in this video I'll make an effort to kind of explain some of the terms or some of the meaning associated with these terms. So let's get right into it. So let's say this is uh, the ventricular volume, left ventricular volume of a certain patient and this is the pressure in a certain patient and we get this graph and let's say this is in normal. But let's say if someone has a graph here or if someone has a graph here, what does that really mean to you? What it means is that in this pink graph, we have decreased volume, right? We have decreased volume, but increased pressure. So this one has decreased volume and increased pressure than the normal. And this one has increased volume and decreased pressure. So there is increased volume and decreased pressure, right? So this graph really deals with the equation of compliance. Now compliance is equal to delta V by delta P, right? When the pressure is increased, the compliance decreases, which is happening in this graph. When the pressure is increased, compliance decreases and the volume also decreases. But when the pressure increases, okay, so when, sorry, when the volume increases, so let's say the volume increases, then the compliance is also going to increase, which is happening in this case. So when do we have increased compliance and when do we have decreased compliance. We have decreased con compliance in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay. Now what are some of the examples of restrictive cardiomyopathy? One example is amyloidosis. Okay. One example is amyloidosis. We have restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now the thing is when you have restrictive cardiomyopathy your heart left ventricle is so freaking st st like stiff right it's so so stiff as a result it cannot really expand or it cannot it, it it loses its ability to really increase in volume right so the the filling of the heart is kind of difficult because it's not expanding at all because the volume just remains the same there's decreased volume right there's decreased volume so so the volume is not going to increase at all which is causing restrictive cardiomyopathy. So when that is happening, when the volume cannot increase in the left ventricle, there is not enough proper filling of the left ventricle, right? In this kind of situation, we have, um, this is called a diastolic dysfunction. And the reason it's called diastolic dysfunction, because what happens during diastole, the heart fills, right? And the filling is prevented by this restrictive cardiomyopathy. As a result, there is diastolic dysfunction. So now let's quickly talk about the opposite. What if the heart was dilated, okay? And it was too much dilated, it just permanently got dilated, which happens in dilated cardiomyopathy. What kind of effect would you see in that case? Well, it's just the opposite of diastolic dysfunction. It's gonna be systolic dysfunction. But why there is gonna be systolic dysfunction? That's because this results when there is failure of, of, of losing or there is, a, there is failure of contraction of the heart to expel the blood out of the heart. So during systole what happens, the heart contracts and even though there is contraction of the heart, the fluid cannot you know, make its way out of the heart. As a result, it kind of stagnates in the left ventricle that's what we understand by systolic dysfunction because even though it's systole the heart cannot really pump out as much volume as it should out of the left ventricle and onto the aorta causing systolic dys dysfunction so we can summarize by saying that diastolic dysfunction happens in restrictive cardiomyopathy uh, and systolic dysfunction happens in dilated cardiomyopathy